Welcome to this edition of Pre-Internet Plane Spotting, brought to you by Jetflix. From 1989 until 1999, the wilds of northwestern British Columbia was the setting for the world's last working Bristol freighter operation. Bristol freighter engineer Paul Hawkins had the good fortune of being able to extensively film Bristol's DFC and TPA on the job with terrace-based transprovincial airlines. We get a good first-hand look at the rigors of working the 50-year-old Bristols between their Bronson Creek base camp and Wrangell in harsh winter conditions that often defied man, muscle, and machine. Hi there, my name is Henry Tenby, and welcome to this edition of Pre-Internet Plane Spotting. We're going to be covering Bronson Creek bus stops, which are all about the interesting, very fascinating, and unique operations that took place at an isolated airfield in northwestern British Columbia called Bronson Creek. The story is, back in the 1980s and 1990s, there was an operating mine called the Snip Mine that was situated very close to Bronson Creek. There was no way in or out by road, so everything that went in or out of the mine had to go by air in the winter months and by barge in the summer months. Bronson Creek, it's only situated about 50 miles from Wrangell in Alaska along the Stikine River, and in the summer months, of course, they could take barges and ships and navigate the waterways. And this airstrip, the Brunson Creek airstrip, is only 5,000 feet long. And of course, it's a non-manned airfield. So when pilots flew into this airstrip, they were on their own. There's no tower there. And it was very precariously situated between mountains and rugged terrain. And it made for very challenging flying. As a result, some aircraft weren't so successful and they met their end at the Bronson Creek airstrip. The Bronson Creek bus steps that I'm gonna be sharing with you today took place in between 1988 and 1997, so a ten, over a 10 year period, and they featured the loss of some really classic prop liners. The great thing about Bronson Creek is that for aviation and prop liner fanatics at the, you know, in the time, back in the 1980s and 90s, this was the place to be for Bristol freighters. The Bristol freighter had already been largely retired from use in New Zealand and the UK, and the final hurrah were Canadian operators operating Bristol freighters on these cargo haul resupply routes between Wrangell and Bronson Creek. So there were two operators that operated the Bristols. The first was Transprovincial Airlines, which was based in Smithers and Terrace, had operating bases, and they actually folded operations in March of 1993. They went bankrupt. And some of the staff that worked for Transprovincial formed a new company called Hawk Air. And the name Hawk Air comes from the name Paul Hawkins. He was actually one of the, uh, the four founders of Hawk Air. So they named the company after his last name. Hawkins became Hawk Air. So Dave Menzies, Paul Hawkins, uh, Rod Hayward, and another fellow, Villeneuve, uh, they formed together and formed Hawk Air from the ashes of Transprovincial. And they resurrected two Bristol Super Freighters and a ATL-98 Carver as their fleet of prop liners that operated until the mine actually ceased operations. This video, I hope you'll find it interesting. I've got some unique footage. Now, my name is Henry Tenby. I operate Jetflix TV, which is an aviation streaming service. If you click in the upper right-hand corner, I've got a special offer for you that you might like to take advantage 
uh, if you'd like to see what Jetflix TV is all about. We have over a thousand aviation videos streaming at your fingertips whenever you want 24 seven. So do check that out. Let's get on with the show. So this spot here is the Bronson Creek airstrip. It's a 5,000 foot strip. And if you can look carefully, I'll just try to zoom in. You can see that it's actually connected right here. This is the Stikeen River. The Stikeen River actually runs from Wrangell all the way to the Bronson Creek airstrip. But in the winter months, it's completely frozen. So barge access isn't possible. In the summer, of course, the barge can easily bring fuel and transport goods and supplies to the mine strip. But in the winter months, it's frozen and it's not possible. And aircraft, cargo aircraft, was the best means of bringing supplies from Wrangell to the Bronson Creek airstrip. So the airlines that served this airstrip, of course, were Canadian cargo operators based in Terrace, British Columbia. Terrace is all the way down here. So they would fly the airplanes from Terrace up to Bronson Creek and they would be based here for the flights between Wrangell and Bronson Creek. This is only about a 50 mile distance. So in a DC-4 Carver uh, or Bristol Super Freighter, we're talking like a 20 minute flight. And as you can see, there's some mountainous terrain, but the airplanes would typically fly through uh, the river valley as that was the easiest point between Wrangell Airport and Bronson Creek. But remember, there's often weather and cloud and turns and uh, precarious flying in this area. So it certainly made a challenge for the crews to make those flights when they were operating back in the 1980s and 1990s. The first Bronson Creek bust up that we're going to present in this show took place in the form of Transprovincial Airlines Yankee Quebec Yankee Bristol Freighter that was involved in a ground loop while landing on the Bronson Creek airstrip on Tuesday, the 21st of June, 1988. While the pilot was attempting to correct for the ground loop, a rather violent landing essentially ripped the landing gear off. It collapsed and the aircraft slid off the runway and was destroyed. As evident in this photo, looking forward from the nose section and the cargo doors, it looks like the entire cargo section from the midsection forward was essentially ripped a kilter and off from the underside of the aircraft. It was definitely a violent landing, but the cockpit remained intact, and luckily there were no serious injuries in this otherwise rather violent landing. Notice how the rear stabs are no longer in alignment with the main wings. This again suggests that the spine of the aircraft was broken, the fuselage was violently twisted, and the forward section of the aircraft was no longer aligned with the fuselage and the rear section of the aircraft. Like most of these aircraft, they were only carrying their crew members. Sometimes they were enthusiasts in, on board, but not in this case. There were only the three crew members. They walked away from the flight. It was inbound from Wrangell Airport. So I guess it was bringing in supplies, possibly fuel. And of course, it was written off as evident here uh, from these photos. The aircraft would have been barged out in pieces in due course and then scrapped uh, from refineries transported from Wrangell. We then jump ahead nearly 10 years to February the 1st, 1997, when Brooks Fuel lost their C-54 Skymaster N44909 at Bronson Creek in a rather unfortunate landing incident, as shown here. Brooks Fuel was based at Fairbanks, Alaska, and like Canadian operators, there were also U.S. operators involved in the fuel resupply business to the mine at Bronson Creek. Brooks Fuel were operating their DC-4, like the Canadian operators, between Wrangell and Bronson Creek. The accident reports suggest that on landing, one of the C-54 Skymaster's main landing gear struck a snow wall, and the aircraft essentially went out of control and came to rest in a snowbank, literally in a snowbank. All four crew members escape uninjured, although the 1944-billed C-54 Skymaster was deemed a write-off. The fuselage burn marks in this photo suggests that the inboard number two engine possibly caught a flame 
as a result of the crash landing. This definitely illustrates how dangerous this work really was. Supporting the SNP gold mine was dangerous work indeed. Lack of roads and a constant requirement for resupply in the form of fuel in and hauling the gold ore concentrate out warranted the use of air support to keep the mine operating. But only those aircraft and pilots willing to handle the risks of dangerous runways, difficult operating conditions, choking terrain, bad weather could handle such a task at hand. The only viable aircraft for this kind of work were prop liners of a bygone era, namely the robust Douglas DC-4 or C-54 Skymaster, the portly Bristol Freighter, and of course the hardy DC-3, and the 747 look-alike in the form of the 1950s Aviation Traders ATL-98 Carver. As evident in this photo, which was taken probably very shortly after the incident occurred, they were able to get that engine fire extinguished before it engulfed the aircraft. And you can see there's a fuel tanker truck on the right side of the image. This suggests that the tanker truck was able to remove the bulk fuel that was contained within tanks of this aircraft. It could have been a very, very uh, violent fuel explosion had they not been able to extinguish that engine fire. And this photo was taken some time after the actual incident. We have an on-site crane uh, which was moved into position probably to assist with the maneuvering of the airframe's hulk onto a barge. Uh, as I said earlier, aircraft that were written off on the Bronson Creek airstrip were dismantled as much as possible on site. And then the parts were transported by water barge to wrangle for disposal. This is a very interesting photograph from 1998 of Hawk Air Bristol Freighter GYQS sitting on the Bronson Creek airstrip down by the river end of the airfield. Notice the very close proximity between the end of the airfield and the running rivers of the water. And here's a cool shot of Hawk Air's Carver Gulf Alpha Alpha Hotel taken in the same position, also around 1998. Barely two months after the Brooks Fuel C-54 Skymaster write-off, Hawk Air sadly wrote off one of their aircraft at Bronson Creek in the form of Bristol Freighter CFTPA. Inbound from Wrangell, the 1953 build Bristol touched down at Bronson Creek and her right main gear collapsed. Like an out of control shopping cart, the aircraft veered and the left main gear collapsed. The right wing then struck the runway surface and the out of control aircraft veered off the runway and came to rest in a grassy area. All three occupants on the aircraft, namely the two pilots and the flight engineer, Paul Hawkins, were able to exit the aircraft without any injuries, fortunately, although the aircraft suffered the worst for the wear. It is believed that the bolts that were attaching the right horizontal gear support to the main wheel failed upon landing. And of course, a cascade of events resulted in the aircraft being written off. These pictures were taken within a very short time of the accident that day. And as we can see in this photo, the emergency escape hatch from the cockpit area on the top of the aircraft is open. So the pictures were probably taken within maybe half an hour of the actual accident. And we can see here the aircraft is nicely sitting in the grass on the side of the runway. Thank goodness no fire ensued as it would have been or could have been a far worse scenario. And that's Paul Hawkins, kneeling underneath the wing of the aircraft, assessing the state of the aircraft after the unfortunate accident. Although no accident of an aircraft can be considered as a good thing, I think everybody concerned here was very glad and fortunate that they walked away from this without any scrapes. That rarely happens. Yes, we had an aircraft that is very old, 50 years old, suffering a bolt attachment problem, 
but luckily there was no loss of life or injuries. And that I think is the most important takeaway. The Bristol Hercules 734 radial engines that powered the Bristol freighter were very thirsty indeed. They consumed approximately 200 gallons per hour, but the venerable Bristol freighter was still very viable in Northwestern British Columbia in the 1980s and 1990s. Due to the unique loading features and excellent payload capabilities into short and very basic airstrips, customers were demanding the Bristol freighter as a replacement for DC-3 and DC-4 aircraft, which required too much dismantling of equipment while the cargo door height or position called for powerful loading equipment. And these equipment requirements were not necessary when utilizing the Bristol freighter as it was equipped with a heavy roller floor to accept palletized loads that could be repositioned on flatbed trailer trucks simply by pushing them inside the fuselage through the front nose or the rear cargo door. This photo shows just how badly the main gear was ripped from underside the aircraft. With a 1700 gallon diesel tank installed, the short range trip into Bronson Creek's 5,000 foot airstrip could yield a profitable 9,000 pound outbound payload of gold ore concentrate due to the generous 12,000 pound load platform available via the Bristol freighter. During the heyday of the gold mine operations at the Snip Mine at Bronson Creek back in the 1990s, the winter diesel fuel demand was up to 6,000 gallons per day. This resulted in basically a high volume of cargo aircraft hauling fuel from Wrangell into Bronson Creek. Bronson Creek was the place to be for classic prop liner aviation enthusiasts in the 1990s, and some said that winter conditions resulted in the place basically looking like a mini Berlin airlift. Even though these photos show that the aircraft doesn't appear to be too badly damaged, it was unfortunately the location of the accident that resulted in the aircraft being written off. Had such an accident happened at the Hawk Air main maintenance base of Terrace, where they have more equipment and more facilities, it would have been probably easier to restore the aircraft to service than having such an unfortunate scenario unfold at a remote location like Bronson Creek. Paul Hawkins actually carried his video camera with him, and he was able to document some of these accidents on video. Those videos actually are part of a two-part Hawk Air Bristol Freighter miniseries that stream on Jetflix TV. You're welcome to create a Jetflix TV account and watch these shows at your leisure. There's a click out link in the upper right hand corner where you can create a Jetflix TV account and enjoy not only the Hawk Air videos, but our entire platform of over a thousand aviation videos for your viewing enjoyment. I do have a personal story I'd like to share with you regarding my interactions with Hawk Air back in the 1990s. As I was an aviation enthusiast that was very interested in prop liners living here in Canada in the 90s, I had a fairly close association as an enthusiast with the owners of Hawk Air, in particular Dave Menzies and Paul Hawkins. At the time uh, when they were acquiring these prop liners and operating them, I was particularly interested in photo and film and documenting their aircraft as they perform their keep and their operations out of the Bronson Creek Strip. At the time, uh, it was around 1997, uh, they had the Bristol and the Carver uh, in operation, but they didn't have titles. They didn't have their name affixed to the side of the aircraft. So I thought it was important that the name Hawk Air uh, in titles be emblazoned across the sides of the aircraft. So in 1998, I was employed uh, here in Vancouver for a small cargo company called Westex and I was involved in their marketing and I had ordered special titles, fuselage titles from a printer uh, here in Vancouver to put the Westex phone number and the name Westex on the side of the Westex aircraft. I approached Hawk Air and I said, hey guys, your airplanes should really have the name Hawk Air on the side of the aircraft. So they said, well, Henry, why don't you take care of that? Let us know how much it's gonna cost 
and I did. I ordered the fuselage name Hawk Air. It was a, a large vinyl sticker, which was printed here in Vancouver. I organized the, uh, the production of that title, and then I actually flew it up uh, on one of our flights up to Terrace one day. We operated a cargo run with a Metroliner out of Vancouver uh, for a courier company up into the central uh, BC interior. And I went on one of the flights one day on the Metro up to Terrace and I carried the, uh, the vinyl cut titles and I personally handed them over to Dave Menzies and Paul Hawkins, and they were then fairly quickly put on the side of the aircraft. A lot of the photographers were filming these aircraft and they didn't have the name Hawk Air, and it was so important for us as aviation fans to photograph aircraft with titles. So there you have it, that's the story. Uh, because of my efforts, we had the name Hawk Air applied to the Hawk Air Bristol and the Hawk Air Carver. So I thought you'd enjoy hearing that story. And thank you, Paul, and thank you, Dave, for entertaining me as an aviation fan so that we could have the names apply to your aircraft. I'd like to especially thank Paul Hawkins for filming extensively as much as he could the Hawk Air operation during his time with his own airline back in the 1990s. Uh, here on YouTube, we've got a couple of DVD previews of the Hawk Air videos that I produced. They were actually in DVD form uh, about 15 years ago. They were released as DVDs. They were both one-hour shows, and they featured Paul Hawkins' footage of the operation. And included in that footage, of course, were some of these accidents that were shown in this particular video. Paul tried to document those as much as he could as well. I believe that some of the photos provided in this show were taken by Paul himself. Others might have been taken by other people. But without Paul's efforts, none of this would have been documented for future posterity. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Paul. And if you're interested, of course, in seeing these videos in their full, they do stream on Jetflix TV. I'd like to thank you for tuning in and watching this edition of Pre-Internet Plane Spotting. I'll look forward to seeing you on the next edition of this show.